Hi guys, it is Friday and it's 2.30 and it's time for Family Friday. We finally have some snow on the ground for our animals and for our forest. And what we're gonna be talking about today is animals in the winter. So from the very beginning of this snow program, we talked about how the sun changes, the seasons change. People, we change. We wear different clothes in the winter. We feel differently sometimes in the winter. We even eat different foods in the winter. So winter really affects all of life. And we're going to talk today how it even affects the animals and it even affects the plants, all living things. So we have some vocabulary words today that I want you to be listening for through the program. Okay, our first one here is squirrel pencil. This is a squirrel pencil. And we're gonna talk more about this. So be listening for the word squirrel pencil. Hibernate, okay? Hibernation is a way that some animals deal with the hardships of winter. They curl up in a safe place and stay nice and warm until the winter ends. So that's hibernate or hibernation. And these are all things, these are all words that animals in the winter, some of them do, okay? Adaptation, okay? And this is a skill that some animals have which helps them survive and do the things that they need to do in the winter. A good example of this, maybe um, you've seen it on an animal channel, is uh, foxes, some foxes and rabbits. What they'll do in the winter, their coat totally changes from brown in the summer and fall to when it goes to winter, they get a completely white coat. That's an adaptation so they can survive and do what they need to do in the snow in winter. If they were brown in the snow, it, they would show up to predators. So that's a really neat thing that some animals can do. Our next one is migrate. And we'll talk about this one when it comes to some of the animals that you get to meet today. And migrate is when an animal knows to leave one area that they've been living for a while and they move out of that area to another area. Usually it's because they will leave an area before winter where it's cold and the food that they eat, um, like hummingbirds. We have hummingbirds here in the summer. Well, the flowers and the hummingbird uh, feeders that we would leave, they would freeze. So the hummingbirds wouldn't get their food. So they have to migrate. They go to someplace warmer, like southern Arizona or Mexico. Okay, butterflies do that. So some anil animals will migrate so they don't stay here in the winter. Listen for those great vocabulary words. So I have a little book here that I got from a friend of mine, and it's called In the Snow, Who's Been There? And this is a really neat book, and it's by Lindsay Barrett George. It's a really great book that helps us to think about what animals are out right now. Because I don't know if you knew this, some animals aren't even out right now. What happens to them? Where do those animals go? What do animals do that are out? because there's not a whole lot to eat. So I wanna take you on a journey today, a winter journey, and let's look at some pictures of about two kids and their dog that went out into the winter forest to see what kind of animals are out. And you might not see them out, but they leave evidence so you can be kind of like winter animal detectives. What kind of things do you think that we could find out in the woods? Maybe you'll find seeds. Maybe you will find leaves that have been torn apart. These are all clues to the animals you might see out in the woods. We do have winter birds here that really 
need our help and maybe put out some bird seed for them. That's one of our crafts that we're going to do today is make a bird feeder so we can watch our winter birds. Maybe you can look up in the trees that have lost their leaves. That's another change that happens to some plants in the winter. They lose their leaves and the tree, some trees, not our ponderosa pine trees, but some trees that lose their leaves, they even slow way down, kind of like some animals that hibernate. Okay, that's gonna be a vocabulary word today. But look up in these trees, you might even see a nest of a bird or a squirrel. Look at it, some of our squirrel friends. Look up even higher and higher in the tree, especially the ponderosa pine tree. You might see a porcupine. We do, we have porcupines here. Only look, don't touch those. They are very pokey. Look in the snow, you might find some tracks or maybe some evidence of some scat or animal poop. That will let us know what animals are there. We do have owls here and they stay out in the winter. Look at the tracks that we might find in the snow. We have deer here in the winter. You can find uh, little balls of scat or deer poop. That's evidence. You can even see deer tracks. Now, talking about tracks, here's a drawing. Could you guess what animal this is? Would you say a squirrel? Here's the front part of the squirrel's feet and there's the back part. So if you see footprints that look like this in the snow, you know a squirrel has been there. Remember we had this friend on our program before? This is our little squirrel that we have here, an Abert squirrel that we have in Flagstaff, they're unique to the ponderosa pine trees here. Another thing, if you see little tufts of pine tree like this just laying in the snow, that's a really good sign that a squirrel, our little Abert squirrel, has been around. Also, if you see these little sticks that are perfectly smooth, they aren't naturally made that way. Our little friend here, the squirrel, these are called squirrel pencils. And our little squirrel made these. They go up into the tree and they get the best little branch that they can find. Sometimes that's why they have to throw the pine needles on the ground to get the branch. And before the squirrel gets this, it has bark, the brown rough stuff all over it. And then our little friend here gets his very, very sharp teeth and he will take all that bark off. And in between the bark and this wood part is a very, very good food that our squirrels here like to eat. It has a lot of protein, a lot of good things in there for them. So they will take all of that good stuff right off of the stick here, and then they leave the stick, which is called the squirrel pencil, they leave that on the ground. So that's another really good evidence of a squirrel being around. Now, I don't know if you can hear some of our bird friends, um, but we have our bird feeders here. We're out in front of the Museum of Northern Arizona. And sometimes I like to come out here and just watch what kind of birds visit our feeder. So that's why we're gonna make a bird feeder today. So maybe you can make a habitat or a home, a winter home in your backyard for animals. Now. We really haven't got to see any animals here today. So we're going to take a trip to a couple places so we can make sure that we see some animals in the winter. Follow me on this snow winter journey and we're gonna go to Arizona today and the deer farm and meet some winter uh, animal friends. Hi guys, we're here at Arizona and it's just kind of right outside of Williams, right? Yep. And this is Kyle. Yeah, welcome Mary and welcome everybody. Uh, so you're at Arizona Wildlife Park today and we're a 160 acre, uh, three mile drive through wildlife park. 
Now, even though we're a drive through wildlife park, you're going to see animals in your own vehicle going into their habitats. You also have a walkthrough portion afterwards. So a lot of our animals you're going to see today are in like your normal zoo setting. And that's what you were talking about. Some of them are going to be a little bit slower, maybe like the grizzly bears. Maybe some of them are a little bit quicker, like the otters. And who knows what we're going to run into today. <laughs> Tons of animals out there bunch of different winter activity and that that's what's great about uh, coming to Arizona is that you come in the summertime you're going to get some activity from certain animals in the winter time a lot of people think animals are slowing down some of them are up and moving around it's great hi guys uh, so uh, welcome to Arizona uh, we've got back here we have Crockett Hannah and Skye and they're all grizzly bears uh, grizzly bears that we were able to rescue out of Montana uh, they're about a year old mom was injured and the cubs needed to find a home at that point in time so we were we were able to uh, bring them here give them good home we got them actually in june of 2020 <laughs> and uh they've acclimated so well to, to the park here you've they got do. they look like they're at home i know it, it's awesome they're, they're comfy sitting. right now <laughs> so kyle we're talking about animals in the winter so tell us what grizzlies and generally kind of what bears do in the winter everything we know about bears is that they're hibernators now, truly what we know about bears is that after scientists have done some research, they're not true hibernators. It's actually all based on food. Um, so here at the park, they're hanging out with us right now. They're like, when's lunchtime? When's dinner time? <laughs> they know they get food all year round. Uh, they're learning that. They understand that. Now, uh, all the bears are still going to uh, stock up for winter, like just in case. I don't know, because it's all this snow out here, all this winter weather that we're getting, maybe there isn't food available, and they're mm -hmm. still going to prepare for that. Wow. Um, now, out in the wild, let's say you go up into Montana where they're from, they need to hibernate. They need to go in that state of hibernation to uh, go into a den for months at a time because there's no food available. Um, other animals, if they're, if they're going to be predators about it, uh, other animals are going to be still hiding very well in the snow. Uh, there's less vegetation uh, out there. And specifically for black bears, which 80% of their diet is for scavenging. They're actually not much of carnivores. Um, all their food goes away at that point in time. Wow. So they really need to sleep. Yeah. Here in Arizona, this is why we hear stories sometimes where they're running through anthem or running uh -huh. into phoenix because uh -huh. there's food down there it's uh -huh. always available at that point in time so right. uh they might actually still wake up and and get a little bit more active going into february wow now i was here last week just checking things out and we did see some black bears yep. and some of the black bears were out roaming around and then um you had like little shelters and a lot of them were in the little shelters now what's happening That's a great question so uh out there what you saw is maybe it's all based on every bear you're a little bit different than i am uh if this snow comes down i'm going to be in bed under the covers that's some of our bears out there some of us want to get up on on onto the mountain and start skiing and snowboarding <laughs> that's what the other bears are doing out there as well so they uh they it's we want to make sure they're all happy we give them enough dens, just like the one behind us right here. There's a smaller one. They get a bigger one back here. The ones you saw on the drive through we want all those opportunities. Some of them don't want a den. Some of them only want to make a nest that we've seen out there. So we give them hay and straw, and they actually make this big old nest around, like a bird nest. Wow. And it's really cool. They don't care if snow comes down on them. They just feel more comfortable with that. So every animal, we want to give them the opportunity for what they want. And when you're driving around, you're in their habitat. So, and, that, and that's, uh, that's something special that you get to experience when you do get to drive around it was these are all black bears so this guy's got a carrot and some uh, orange slices that were just eat bears so we won't actually have any grizzly bears in the drive through your grizzly bears can get up to thousand pounds uh, and for some people's car that is a little bit too big yeah, so really. grizzly bears will always be in our walkthrough and our black bears uh, can be in both at that here's one just outside the den you can tell they don't go very far to poop Thing. You've got some scat there as well. <laughs> oh yeah, there's real bear scat. I've yep. never seen bear scat. They do go in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> some of them will come right out just outside the den. Like, I still want some fresh air. I'm uh -huh. going to come out. I'm going to be out for a little bit. If it was snowing, if it was raining, they would be right in there. Oh, sure, me too. Oh, there's... But that one uh, doesn't want one of the dens. Says, I would rather do this out of pine needles and straw and hay. And starts building that nest around him. Huh. This is a Jack and Babe. They are brother and sister. Uh, they love to cuddle together. They've been together their entire life. They're almost inseparable like that. They love to nest up together, den up together. 
We are over here at the elk habitat and I was told this is Ace that's coming up to see us and Kyle's going to tell us about Ace. So Ace is our, our big bull elk. Uh, he is very well fed here at the park. He actually has his own pelleted food. Um, so that's why you'll see such great antler growth on him is because he's got all the nutrition he's looking for. Uh, whereas in the wild, they're having to look for so much. Right now, the girls that we have are in the back area. Hi, Ace. Are you scenting right now? You're, you're putting your smell all over the place. It's like, yeah, I'm the boss around here. <laughs> I'm in charge. And when elk go in the rut, they all think they're in charge. And yeah. he's... Can you tell us what rut is? Yeah, so rut is when he's going to be uh, having a lot of hormones go through him because he thinks it's time to breed. And for them out in the wild as well, it is time for them to breed. Now here at the park, we don't want him breeding as well, so we're going to do no breeding here at the park. What we end up doing is we actually end up vasectomizing Ace so he still has the testosterone to grow his antlers to be able to go through rut and yes he gets to be an angry boy at that point in time uh, but that's still a natural behavior he's going to go out into the wild and uh, to kind of prove it you can see all the trees out here that he's rubbed on and and thrashed and awesome we are so happy that he can do that uh, makes it a little bit uglier for us to look at but that's what elk do and if that's what elk do we, that's what we want them to do here at the park <laughs> Now, will Ace lose those antlers? Because that's the difference between horn and antlers, is that the antlers you can lose. Exactly. Uh, he's going to uh, drop his antlers probably coming up in April uh, is when we typically see him. He might hold on to them a little bit longer than the ones out in the wild, uh, but uh, he'll drop his antlers and just start growing new ones right away. Typically, they get a little bit bigger each year. Now, he's also going to start becoming an old man pretty soon, and that's weird to say for an elk that might only be six years old, seven years old, but their genetics tell them they don't get that old in the wild. So maybe his antlers shrink a little bit at the same point in time. Wow, and if we do see a beautiful animal like Ace, an elk out in the wild, um, even though they they look beautiful, we should never go near them. Mary, you're nailing it today. <laughs> this is, this is, you're hired, thank you. Uh, we hear so many stories of trying to get up close, trying to get that selfie with the animal, and uh, so many injuries happen, even deaths happen because of that every single year. Um, up in the Grand Canyon specifically, people typically try to uh, get too close and, and imagine that coming at you. I mean, 20 miles per hour, um, that, that could do a lot of damage. We don't want that to happen to anybody. Uh, the best thing I can leave you with today, if you care, leave it there. If you think it needs to be rescued, if you care, leave it there. Get in touch with your, your local Arizona Game and Fish. Um, they can better understand the situation. If you think that animal is, is nice to pet, still, if you care, leave it there. We don't want that animal to be in any sort of altercation with you. I feel incredibly blessed that I can be this close safely to Ace. I have never seen <laughs> antlers this close up, and it is just incredible. So do the bison rub their head like the elk do? Yes, they do. So we're oh, protecting just that. some of them right now. They're not too bad about it. And here's some of the calves that were born Aww. this last year. And when they're first born, they're about a 40 pound baby. So, oh my goodness. yep, wow. they're already a big baby and uh, uh, got to quickly adapt to being out here and being part of the herd. And the herd is great about it. They're all uh, pretty great at being parents. Um, this is our bighorn sheep enclosure, and uh, we have Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. So there are desert bighorn that live here in the state. Arizona actually has both uh, types of uh, in the wild as well. Look at that. Now those so, are horns. Yep, so those are horns. He's not going to shed those off. They continue to grow. He's got uh, a nice curl, and then you can see how it curls almost all the way around. Incredible. And then we'll have babies born here as well, going into springtime. Some of these little ones were last year's spring babies. You actually see kind of a game trail that they've made right there as well. Mm -hmm. They'll use that to kind of get up the mountain uh, or up the hill back up onto the road right here. They say, well, if you use it, it makes it a little bit easier for me. Moving into our mule deer and coos deer exhibit. These are all native species. And actually, you got both coos deer right there. Now, being a coos deer is a white-tailed deer down in southern Arizona. 
they can still live as far up north into Williams. Again, they might travel a little bit more down south to get warmer weather going into wintertime. But these guys are uh, both rescues as well. They were actually picked up out of the wild. And like I said, if you care, leave it there. That is the best thing you can do for every animal. Um, and too many people pick them up out of the wild, think they need to be rescued. They know they're not like the other mule deer instead. Aww. These ones are going to be found more around our area, up in the Flagstaff and Williams. Uh, mule deer, you'll be able to tell, having them stand up like that. Uh, their tail is a all white butt and tail like that, except the tip of it's been pretty much dipped in black ink. It's what it looks like. Your white tail coos deer, it's all hidden underneath. So they have to actually lift their tail up to see the big white marking, trying to flash it to say, hey, predators are nearby or something scary nearby. And actually something fun about winter time is how they walk along the car as well uh, because hey if you got a nice free path to walk yeah. along why should i walk along really? the snowy section yeah. they're great at creating their own little trails just like they do in the wild uh, going up very specific directions up a mountain or along a trail um, that's the easiest way to go and you see what we call game trails um, you'll see a lot of scat and markings on those trails as well but here at the park it can work the same way. They have some sections that go through the woods right here. Sometimes it's just easier to take the road because I'm not, nothing to worry about here. This is my home you're driving through. <laughs> <laughs> and in here, this, you've got Twilight, Juno, which are Arctic wolves. They're the two white ones. And you've got Shadow there. Now Shadow there is showing some, uh, I think uh, Juno might be showing some dominance towards Shadow. Oh, Shadow's yeah, got a tail that. between his legs. Oh, and yeah. that's okay. Yeah. We're okay seeing that. Uh -huh. We're not seeing any injuries happen. Huh. Again, Juno's in charge. The cool thing is, is that Shadow is a tundra wolf, just like the previous two we just saw. He was actually supposed to be in that exhibit. But what we saw from Victorio and Geronimo is Shadow didn't respect them. He was always saying, I'm alpha. I'm on the top of the Look totem pole. Tails. Oh, yeah? You kind of see oh, him. He's still God. getting a little bit lower oh, than uh, lower than Juno. There we go. What an experience oh right now. Oh my gosh. But what we saw is that Shadow wasn't getting along with those other Tundra Wolves. So we tried to introduce them to this group, and it's worked so much better. Oh. Yes, that room is a Barizona sign. That sign says Arctic Wolves. Why aren't they all Arctic Wolves? That's okay. What's most important is that Shadow's getting along out here, and he's a, a much happier wolf being with these Arctics instead. Okay, so we saw some javelina out, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to have Kyle talk to us about what javelina do normally in the winter. And Mary, it was so exciting for you just to even point out the javelina. A lot of people see him, and they're like, gross, javelina. Oh, yeah, yeah and they're, they're awesome animals. We've got four as our little herd right here, right here. Now, did you happen to see what they were doing there? They were rubbing their heads up. Now, before we even talk about winter, that's one of the coolest things I love about javelina is they've got a scent gland over their rump right there. If you go down their back, you can see a little tuft of hair. It almost just sits over differently because there's a scent gland right there, and that's how they create this family atmosphere in their herd. They're rubbing smells on each other right now. They're each rubbing on, on, the, on their backside, and it was so cool to see that and to be able to see it right here on camera is, uh, is something great. Oh, that is sweet. We still have to consider what these animals do in the winter time. Uh, so for javelina, uh, they are uh, great at migrating towards warmer weather. Now, up here in northern Arizona, we're still going to have javelina around. Obviously, look at our exhibit here. We can still have snow in it. We still provide them a nice den. And, and, and in the wild, they're going to need to find something like that at the same time. But some javelina are going to be... You know what? I'm going to get out of here. This is not for me. <laughs> going back uh, to, uh, I want to be in bed under the covers during the winter time. Some of them are going to drop off in elevation, maybe go down to Sedona, uh, just south of Williams. Like here. snowbirds. Exactly. They're <laughs> snowbirds. They get out of here and they're, they're pretty happy for it. So uh, these guys, we just make sure they're happy and comfortable uh, and they get plenty of straw and hay in their den and they've done very, very well in their, their environment. Well, that is great, and I'm glad that you were able to give that information to us because um, around Flagstaff, a lot of people didn't believe that javelina were hanging around here, and I have actually seen them in the Rio de Flag that's over by the museum, exactly. so I knew that they were here, but um, a lot of uh, Flagstaff local people were saying that we 
not always had javelina here, but it's it's interesting to hear how they can come and go. Exactly, and then and that's just a good reminder as well. Even though they look like pigs right now, uh, they are considered a peccary. Uh, they look like not that dangerous dangerous of an animal. No, they're in the area and they can still be very dangerous. Uh, hi, Olivia. Are you saying hi oh. to us? <laughs> but uh, with that, um, this is also a good reminder to keep your dogs on the leash uh, because if your dog goes chasing after them, you'll see your dog running away and they have some humongous teeth still in there that can do some damage to not only humans but our pets as well. Yeah, they can eat the prickly pear, right? So they must be able to have pretty tough teeth. And what are they doing with their nose? Is she smelling us or? Yeah, she's smelling us right now. She's wondering uh, what we're doing over here. Are we going to bring any snacks as well? Uh, they're going to be getting their diet actually pretty soon. They're more of a midday animal that we like to provide so they can sleep in and, uh, <laughs> and stay warm during the, the morning. So they're like, hey, uh, do you have our diet right now? And you can see those nose. <laughs> Is working right now uh -huh. like hey what do you have are you gonna give me something oh i would love just to kiss that little I pink know. nose <laughs> this is by far the best winter animal you'll have uh, mountain goats are up there arctic wolves are up there i can't say anything beats uh, otters because they're swimming in this weather i don't think anything else wants to swim in this weather <laughs> they are very playful animals they've actually got a dual layer coat that acts as a wetsuit for them right now so hopping in the water like this is perfect and an older exhibit we actually used to have the pond freeze over and we would put holes into the pond and and they would actually hop in and out of those holes while it was still frozen over uh, so that was so much fun to see and then the snow only helps playtime. Uh, otters are already so active, their metabolism moves so much uh, that uh, this snow is, is a perfect sliding material, um, <laughs> perfect perfect snowball throwing material for some of them as well. They throw snowballs? No, I wish they did. <laughs> maybe maybe they'll, uh, they'll flip it up a little bit. You know, you like your dog and cat at home, they get like a puppy craze. They're running around, they're, they're doing donuts in the, in the snow. It's so much fun to watch otters. They're, they're one of the best animals in the park. It is incredible to see them in the snow and obviously they're quite comfortable and they're still wet and it's just so wonderful how Mother Nature gives them what they need. Exactly and for, for them they still have food available. Going into the water there's still fish down there. Uh, they're, they're strictly going to be eating meat. Now they're in that ferret family uh, and if anybody's owned ferrets before you got to give them their own special food. You can't give them cat food or dog food. They need that extra protein in their diet as well. Uh, so for them, we give them some of our carnivore diet and lots and lots of fish, uh, trout, smelt, herring, and uh, they eat about, I think it's about 15% of their body weight. Uh, so much food uh, that they get fed daily, and they go through it quickly. Imagine being going swimming, you're always hungry afterwards. These guys are always swimming, so they're, they're going to need a lot of food uh, all year round. And then with the weather going a little bit colder, they're going to need a little bit more as well. Oh, so they're, they do eat a little bit more food in the winter than they would in the summer? Yep, so we've seen diets go up uh, in the wintertime, and that varies for every animal. Some animals are going to slow down, so we have to bring their diets down. Well, it has been so much fun today, so thank you for taking us around your beautiful place today. Thank you. And, yeah, we enjoyed having you, um, and we hope uh, others can just make it out here. Hi everybody, we're here at the Deer Farm, which is just outside of Winslow. Um, if you're in Winslow, you'd be heading towards uh, Flagstaff or you were coming back from the Grand Canyon, you can see the Deer Farm. And I'm here with Amy. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, why don't you tell us what you do here? Yeah, I'm the Director of Animal Care here at the Grand Canyon Deer Farm. Um, the Deer Farm, started in 1969 and the current owners have had it over 30 years. Basically it's it's like a park you walk in, you feed the deer, you're with the deer, they come up to you. Um, <laughs> it's a quarter of a mile all the way around and you can see other animals as well. All right, what kind of other animals do you have here? We have several different species of deer. We also have a bison, we have a camel, African oh. crested porcupines. We have some Cotamundi marmosets. We have miniature horses, miniature donkeys, a zonkey. <laughs> we have my one of my favorites is the reindeer, which is a species of deer. 
and so not all of these deer are are local. They're not he, just native to Arizona. No. They, okay. No. The only deer that are native to Arizona are our rescues, and those would include the mule deer, the coos deer, and the elk. Nice. And look at that beautiful bison over there. He yeah, looks, she's I don't beautiful. Know. Yeah, her she? name's Ginger. Yeah. Oh, she's very well taken care yeah, of. Yeah, she's a sweetheart. Beautiful coat. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when you come to the deer farm, uh, you walk in with this herd of deer, and you can feed them out of your hand. You can also feed some of the other rescue deer up top. Um, some of the interesting adaptations that deer have to deal with the winter. Number one is if there's a storm, they tend to bed down and let the snow cover them. And if you watch, it's kind of cool, the snow doesn't melt on them. And they, um, it's because of all the, the insulating hair that they have. And those hairs are called guard hairs. And if you were to take one and cut it in half, you could see it's hollow on the inside. Wow. And so the air, you know, is what's insulating. Mm -hmm. um, they also have an undercoat, which is like that wool real soft fine fine wool mm -hmm. that is not waterproof it's the guard hairs that is really like waterproof and and the combination of the two is extremely insulating now is that all deer have have that yeah for yeah. well the deer that are that are for living in winter environments okay. some of the you know asian deer some of like the like an axis deer doesn't grow the same kind of coat because they're not in the cold weather. Yeah. One of the adaptations that reindeer have is they have really broad hooves. Yeah, look at that. They're not like the deer here. If you look yes. over here, they're small. These are real broad so that they can walk into the, walk in the snow, like a, a snowshoe. Ah. And their, oh my gosh. their nose is, is covered in fur. Oh. And um, they too have that insulating hair. Oh, you are a sweetheart. Wow, you have beautiful antlers. Yes, they can grow two wow. inches a day. Two yeah. inches a day. Yes, during the, the peak growth we've, wow. we've observed. Now, I see what kind of looks like blood. Is, is yeah, that... that's part of the velvet that he rubbed off. Mm -hmm. Once once they're done growing their antlers, which okay. are covered in like this soft, we can velvety fur. see some there. Fur, yeah. Oh, right there. Yeah. Um, it's when it's growing it's filled with blood vessels and and um, once it's done growing it that dries up and uh -huh. they rub this off and it, it's just hard antler there's no there's no blood supply going to these antlers anymore so okay it wouldn't hurt if he broke one off right or okay yeah. that's good that's good to know yeah. um, we found out today that the elk in April I think they lose yeah, their antlers. They do, yeah. What about reindeer? The reindeer normally, after the mating season, they drop the antlers. So before Christmas, the males generally lose their antlers. This year, it's been extended, um, and it depends on the region too. But the females won't lose their antlers, so you know they keep the same antlers They'll all the lose time. Them later, they'll okay. lose them after Christmas. Okay. Yeah. But the males generally lose them before Christmas. Yeah, and and the reindeer are females are the only kind of deer where both the males and the females have antlers. All other deer species, it's just the males. Wow. Okay, so we have the female reindeer here compared to the male. You can see she has antlers. Um, one of the cool things about reindeer that does not occur in Arizona but it does occur in their Arctic environment is during the winter the the um, it's nighttime you know the Sun doesn't come up so normally when it's the summer they have this golden brown eye color during the winter though when it's really dark their eyes actually turn blue and it allows for the light to scatter to their retina and it allows them to see better they can see predators they can see food and their main diet during the winter in the arctic is lichen yeah. and they have a special enzyme reindeer have a special enzyme that breaks down lichen into glucose so wow. they can utilize the energy from the lichen which is the stuff that you see around northern arizona growing on the rocks perfect so, yeah it's a specialized diet winter diet and it helps them survive in the winter
her antlers look much smaller than yes. the females have smaller antlers but they hold on to them longer and they there's speculation that it's to you know push away the males because they're the mating season's over and they need to get food they can push the snow with their antlers and their feet and just to protect when they have babies their calves they can use those antlers okay so guys what we're going to do here is we are going to make a bird feeder and you'll be able to put this outside and see what kind of winter birds come to your feeder all right so what you're going to we do have a material list on our facebook page um, so you can look at that or you can remember write it down now you need a cup a whole cup of uh, bird seed okay you have to have two tablespoons two big spoons of coconut oil it's going to look like this okay it looks it's like fat it's lard kind of but this is healthier for the birds because it's coconut okay and you'll put two tablespoons of the coconut oil in a bowl and you're gonna microwave it for like 60 seconds. I did it 30 seconds at a time. So you have a liquid, okay? And we are going to use cookie cutters, okay, to make the shape. And you can use any kind of cookie cutter you like, okay? You need to get some wax paper and you'll need an area to be able to get messy and um, the coconut oil could be hot after the microwave so be very careful and do this part that hot coconut oil do that with an adult because i don't want anybody to get burnt okay um, you will also need kind of like um, just i'm using the end of a plastic knife because you're going to want to make a hole in the top of your bird feeder shape so when it gets all hard, then you can get some string or ribbon and um, thread it through the hole and then tie it on your branch, okay? So we have our area, we have all of our stuff. I have my coconut oil uh, liquid and I already measured this out so I know it is a cup of bird seed. And I'm just gonna dump that right into my coconut oil. Okay, I'm gonna pull my, seat, uh, my sleeves up. This is gonna be uh, messy, okay? If you've ever made, see, it's like, ew, gooey. Oh, we need to have some Pam spray or some kind of spray, because we're going to spray our cookie cutter so our bird seed mixture doesn't stick to the cookie cutter. It'll come out real nice when it's ready. Um, if you ever have made, uh, peanut butter on pine cones and rolled it in the bird seed. It's really, really messy. This is like that too. Okay, so I have all my coconut and my bird seed all mixed up nice and it's well coated and mixed uh, in. And I'm gonna just drip that. I might have used too much coconut oil, you guys. So go sparingly on the coconut oil okay but if you use too much like i use too much it is just gonna drain right out onto your wax paper so no problem so now you see how the shape is going to be like your cookie cutter and you're going to have to leave i'm hoping this will be able to Okay, it's gonna fall over. Okay, I just love doing these experiments with you guys. So what I would use when you're doing this, use like chopsticks and break it in half. I don't have chopsticks here at the museum, but get a chopstick, break it in half, and then just set it up in your cookie cutter bird seed, and yours will stay. Let's see if I can't break this and I'm gonna make it stay just like that, okay? Because we want that hole to form so we can have something to thread our ribbon or our yarn. So you're gonna take this whole thing just like this and you're gonna put it in your refrigerator, probably for a day or two, 
okay? Until everything is really all held together and very firm. Then you'll pop it right out of your cookie cutter. So that way you'll just have a heart shaped or whatever kind of cookie cutter shape um, bird seed and then thread the ribbon or yarn and go put it out in uh, the tree, tie it to a branch that is close to a window of, of your house. So you could stand inside in, the, in front of the window and you'll be able to see the beautiful winter birds that will come and eat at your feeder. You guys, I've had such a great winter adventure and journey with you today between going to Arizona and meeting Kyle and talking with him of all those incredible animals and how winter affects them and seeing Amy at the deer farm and I fed a porcupine that was incredible and fed a cookie to a reindeer that's just incredible so I am so have so much fun going on these journeys with you guys. This is a little cave setup that I used to do when I was little in Ohio when it was snowing out. My grandma would build a fort inside for me and we'd read stories and have hot chocolate. And I did that with my boys too. And it was fun. So in your warm house, build a little fort, maybe like a cave so you can hibernate and take a book and some hot chocolate and enjoy the season, guys. Bye.